Now I go. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, thank the organizers for putting together this workshop, in particular for being so child-friendly in doing so, uh, because the summer school holidays have just started, and so I was relying on you know, bringing a kid. Also, while I was preparing my slides, I want to say yesterday, but more this morning, uh, she uh, decorated the slides a lot, so there will be you know, a lot of extra material on my slides. If at the end of my talk you have questions about operator algebras, come to me. If you have questions about the illustrations, come to her. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the quantum causal compatibility problem. And uh, here is, uh, not yet, aha, that's how it works. So um, here's the, the, the outline of the talk. I have many things I want to go through. And actually, I think there was a bit of a misconception I had uh, when you know, first preparing the talk, because I was asked to contribute to a quantum information session, so I thought it would be small and specialized. So I wanted to talk uh, about you know, all these um, technical results we have. But then I see it's much broader here, and it's much more open for everybody. So um, yeah, yesterday, I reworked my slides, and it means that from between 90% and my entire talk, I will not actually you know, come to our technical results, but I will kind of advertise this entire research field and tell you why you should care and why it's interesting and why people like it. And yeah, so I don't know, in the end, I have many slides I can you know, go through step by step uh, with, with more technical ideas, but um, at some point of time, the chairman will cut me, cut me short, and then there is no big loss, I think. All right, good, so let's start, and let's start very softly. And, um, Let's start with a background on quantum correlations. That's a page from this book, Flying Away, by the way, I've been told. Um, OK, so let's actually go back to what is maybe the first problem to be considered you know, in the field that later became quantum information. Yeah, the first problem ever was the problem of classifying the degree of non-locality in correlations. So what does that mean? So we look at experiments where there are several observers, Alice here, Bob on that side, and they perform uh, measurements on a, a quantum state that shares, you know, was prepared in some central source. And uh, yeah, we look at the, the log uh, of, of, of the data that comes out of that, and we want to understand whether this data is compatible with the classical information or not. And so in the absolutely easiest case, there's an easy way of doing it, namely, uh, we can you know, look at the CSHSH uh, correlator that I'm sure many of you, or most of you have seen, and if not, you go to a <laughs> to Harald Weinfurter's group, and the people will explain to you what it means. And uh, there is a hierarchy of values this correlator can take. It measures strength of correlations, right? And so um, the data you get is compatible with some classical process if this correlation function takes a value at most two. No? And that is known since the 1960s. Then we know if it's between two and two squared of two, then it's compatible with some quantum process. That's what we can achieve. We know since the 1980s. And um, right, more, more generally, any value um, up to four is, is, is still compatible with the laws of special relativity. And so what we can do is now, in the space of correlations, we have this nested sets, which are kind of uh, yeah, um, sketched here uh, in, in a caricature. We have this, this local or classical correlations uh, delineated here. Then we, we can go a little bit above it using quantum mechanics. And we can still go yet further above it without violating the laws of, um, of special relativity. OK, so, right, so it's an old question, very active since the 1960s. Still, you can ask, why do we care about classifying correlations? And there's a number of reasons. The first one is uh, curiosity, I guess, no? Because you know, these were really the arguments that convinced people that quantum mechanics is fundamentally different from, from classical mechanics, and that you know, there would be no quasi-classical theory that can ever be developed, even though quantum mechanics can turn out to be you know, not the final theory of the, of the universe, we can never go back to classical. Then more uh, practically, there's quantum crypto. Again, if we look at you know, what uh, uh, Harald Weinfurter and his group do know whenever they uh, run a quantum crypto protocol, then it works to the extent it works only because you're in this regime that is beyond classical. Everything that's classical is insecure, but still quantum. Everything that's not even quantum, you can't even do. Right? So that's a pragmatic way uh, of, of looking at it. There's another reason to care about this body of correlations, and that comes from many body physics. Yeah, so um, many body uh, properties are also described by, by co correlation functions. And so, for example, if the Ulrich Schollwerk gang, if they run, um, like, for example, a DMIG calculation, um, they will find upper bounds on ground state energies. And using these techniques, you can find lower bounds on ground state energies and ideally sandwich 
uh, the truth between the two and, and get a, um, yeah, a good understanding of your system. So there's many reasons to care about that. All right, so what is known about these sets? And uh, that's going to be a bit of a more complicated story, so let me go through the various cases and give you a feeling. So the first, um, yeah, let's first think about this local, this classical set. Can we characterize it, yes or no? And here's an answer. So the answer is, you know, there is these Bell inequalities, like the C value being less than or equal to, to 2, and it turns out that a set of, 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 of correlations that you measure is classical if and only if the data satisfies all possible Bell inequalities. So this inequality formulation that Bell dreamt up in the 1960s is in fact complete. Yeah, and, and all indeed means there's only finitely many, and so what that means geometrically is that the classical set is some kind of polytope, so every inequality describes a half space in the set of correlations, and a polytope means it's a body described by finitely many of these inequalities. So, so this you can check, it's very easy, very geometric. Um, the picture is a little bit misleading because if you scale up the number of parties that can do measurements, the number of settings, so measurement devices owned by each party and the number of outcomes, then these polytopes become extremely complex. So if, uh, yeah, if these values are high, then it's what in, in complexity theory is called NP-hard, which means uh, in reality there is no efficient general purpose algorithm. But if you fix any of uh, these parameters, then uh, yeah, it's just a, a, a polytope you have to reason about and, uh, and this is done using linear programming, so that is not actually very complicated to do. And so this was completely understood by the late 1990s. I think Asha Paris uh, famously identified this uh, convex you know, nature and, and, and initiated the program of describing all Bell inequalities. So classical is, is kind of easy. All right, so now next question is, we want to do, do in the sliver, you know, that is no longer classical, but still quantum, and so when are correlations quantum? And that turns out outrageously to be very complicated for you know, a very surprising reason maybe, namely um, what do I actually mean by a quantum correlation? And you think that is you know, one of the most fundamental notions of quantum information theory, but it turns out in the last few years that we don't actually agree as a field what a quantum correlation is, how to correctly model it uh, mathematically, right? And, and what it boils down to is that they are the set of allowed correlations depends on how one models locality in quantum mechanics. So let's talk about this for a few minutes because that is a surprisingly difficult topic. Okay. So how do you learn to describe local systems in low energy physics and also in quantum information? Well, you know, quantum mechanics one, you say each party has a Hilbert space and the total Hilbert space is a tensor product. And if you look at correlations, so the probability of observing outcome A on Alice's side, outcome B on Bob's side, given that Alice measured in setting X and Bob measured in setting Y. What you do is you take Alice's observable, you take Bob's observable, you tender them together, and you take the matrix element between a, a state. Yeah, that's what you learn. And so everybody was happy with this until a few years ago, a paper appeared with this extremely cryptic title. It's called MIP star equals RE. So I don't know, like, pop, you know, popular communication was not the strong suit of this paper. And it's, um, yeah, it showed that, that it showed a remarkable result, you know, it's the following. You want to, you have a, a data set and you want to decide whether it is in this quantum region. And this paper says, if you model locality the way we always do it, then there is no algorithm for this problem. So no computer, no human, no way of reasoning at all can decide, um, yeah, can characterize this set of quantum correlations at all. And uh, yeah, that's understood since 2020 and I made a little star here you know, at understood because it's a 160 page paper and I don't know anybody who actually claims that they understand it. Certainly I haven't worked, worked through the details myself, I have to admit. Okay, hmm. so maybe then the pro program dies here because we just can't reason algorithmically oh. about these sets. They might be just too complicated. Right, but actually in relativistic quantum field theory, as you all know, or also in algebraic quantum mechanics, as you may not know, um, there is a different way of modeling locality. Yeah, what you do in, in a field theory is that with every region of space-time, you associate the fields that are defined there and an observer located in this region of space-time, they can build observables out of these uh, fields. And the, the micro-causality assumption of, of, of field theory says that observables in different space-time re regions, when they are space-like separated, they have to commute. So there is no notion of a tensor product anymore, just commutativity. So in this model, 
correlations are given by you take an observable of on, in Alice's region and observable in Bob's region, and they just have to commute. They don't need to be on different tensor factors. And this problem turns out to be much easier to treat algorithmically. It's still difficult. Uh, oh, this actually understood. There should be no star here. <laughs> That's not so difficult. So there is what is called a converging sequence of semi-definite programs. Now I have to tell you what that means. Okay, so this little ellipse here is um, a caricature of the set we want to characterize, a set of quantum correlations. And what one can um, work out is a sequence of, of algorithms that are better and better, so you go from the outside to the inside, that give an ever more tight characterization of that set, and every one of these outer approximations is easy to implement on a computer using a technique called semi-definite programming. Yeah? So it means if I have a data set, a data set is some point in correlation space, then as you increase, the, if you, you know, go up the sequence, at some point of time you will find a sequence if it's incompatible with quantum, at some point of time you will find um, a program that witnesses this, that tells you this is not quantum. Yeah? So what one can is one can prove inco incompatibility in finite time. Yeah? If, if um, all your finite levels of the hierarchy say compatible, 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 you never know whether this might change in the future, but at least if it's incompatible that you can, uh, yeah, that you can uh, witness. All right. So here's the summary of my first part, you know, what's the high-level overview. Okay, so classical correlations can be characterized by linear programs. It's very easy, even though these things become big. Um, there are actually two definitions of what quantum correlations are, and we don't know at this point which one is the right one to use, which one is physical. Um, they seem to agree in practice, so that we know there must be disagreements, but they maybe they're only in some esoteric settings that don't actually appear. Yeah, tensor product correlations cannot be algorithmically characterized at all, outrageously. Commuting observable ones can, so we will work with those a bit pragmatically, no? since we don't know which of the two models is the right one and one we can handle, that is the one we will use in the remainder of this presentation. Good. Right, this has all been known and all been done. So what I now do is I now you know, make this problem a little more complicated to steer you a bit towards the problem that we are working on. And then we have to talk a little bit about causation. All right, so no uh, nerdy talk without an XKCD comic, so let me present this one. So there's two figures. And one says, I used to think correlation implied causation. And then, then I took a statistics class, now I don't. And she says, oh, sounds like the class helped. And he says, maybe. Right? OK. Actually, I thought that was funny. Um, <coughs> so um, right. So seeing co yeah, correlation and causation are famously different. But are there? OK. So let me give you one example, which is uh, an example I didn't make up, but there's part of the social science research literature that's often cited in this context, namely there is a famous study asking whether obesity is contagious. Namely, there's an empirical finding that people of similar body weight are more likely to be friends. Now, there is, that's a correlation, you see. Now, there could be various causal explanations. So let's go through some hypotheses. It could be that the causal error goes in that direction. So you prefer to have friends of similar body constitution. Or it could be that there's a reverse error. You imitate the habits of your friends. And so that would be you know, the study headline, whether obesity is contagious. Or it could be that there is an unobserved common cause. For example, you go to this MCQST conference, and then you get many friends, and you <laughs> go to the hut and have a dinner there. And uh, I have to report, I, I've given this introductory slide in, on many conferences since a decade, and I've made this joke many times, and they just changed the name of the conference, and it turns out many conferences have a lot of food, so you know, it kind of always works. All right, good. So now the question is um, whether if we just have correlations, they can ever tell us something about which causal model is the right one. And so it turns out if you only have two variables, like friendship and body weight, then this is not possible. But if you have more than two variables, distributions do sometimes hold information about causality. And so that's what I want to talk to you about now. This is used in the social sciences. That is some hypothesis about mental health causal networks in the social science, probably very hard to, to uh, treat. We are going to look at idealized settings of very simple causal models. So let me tell you a little bit about that. OK, so we're going to make this compatibility problem of causal correlations a little bit harder in that we are imposing a causal structure on quantum states. Let's maybe look at this lower example, which is the easiest. We have three observers, Alice, Bob, and Charlie. And they don't just perform measurements on some global quantum state, but we make this causal hypothesis that the quantum state was generated by first you know, Alice and Bob sharing one state, and then Bob and Charlie sharing an independent state. And, and Bob can measure on both of this, these halves. 
So if you write it out, I don't know whether you can all see it, maybe it's a bit, little bit low. Um, so these correlations now written in the tensor product model, which is more familiar, are of the form um, measuring, do a measurement by, on, by Alice, by Bob, by Charlie, and the state they are measuring on factorizes across this cut in the middle of Bob. Okay. And uh, right, now um, I can explain the title of my talk, namely what is the quantum causal compatibility problem is given as input a classical distribution that people might have measured in the lab and the candidate causal structure, like you know, a diagram like this, uh, can you find out whether the two are compatible or not? Yeah, so it's the problem that we had before, but now with this independence constraint in addition. So what is known there? It is very difficult even classically. Even classical statistics have started thinking about this maybe 20 years ago, and they aren't very far along either. And so what, yeah, what I call causal, some people call network. That's just the same thing. And what makes it so difficult is that we have these additional independence constraints, and that is a non-convex constraint. So these sets look much more, have a much more complicated form. Right? And so we need to have some ways of dealing with those. Good. All right, again, we can ask, why do we care about this? Again, you know, number one is probably curiosity. It's, you know, the relation between, you know, uh, what correlations are possible in nature appeals to people who think fundamentally. How does correlation and causation, uh, you know, can be linked together also appeals to, the, appeals to the same kind of people. So I guess, you know, I just care for the sake of itself. But of course, also, um, there are, again, applications in quantum communication, namely if you go to settings where you don't just have Alice and Bob exchanging photons, but you have a more complicating, complicated setup as some people um, um, are, are building at the moment, you know, centered, for example, this big project centered in the Netherlands, trying to build up a, a quantum internet where there's many parties and non-trivial network structures. So what can you even do there? For this, you have to understand what is possible classically in a network and what is possibly quantum in a network, and neither of these two questions are well understood at this point. So there's a lot of fundamental research to be done. Okay, so good. So then this is the introduction of my talk, so that's why I care about it, that's what we want to look at, and you know, the background is that basically nothing is known, that's a bit too much, but very little is known, very little complete information has been achieved. Okay, and so in the when you know, okay, so that's that is actually you know I've now succeeded in telling you why I care about this. I will now, under the sh chairman, uh, shuts me down. We'll go through various ideas that go into our results, but I can stop at any time because I think you know the last logical point is now. I have uh, nine minutes apparently. Okay, good. So here's a technical result. Um, it's a joint work, uh, by the way, with uh, Lawrence, uh, a PhD student in the group who used to work uh, with the second speaker at the institute run by yesterday's speaker, and with uh, Mariami, who used to work with uh, Barbara Kraus, so, uh, also yesterday's speaker, and, uh, and uh, did she speak? Okay, a speaker here, and of course, local faculty. So it's all very, you know, it's a small family. Okay, and what is the results that, that are very recent? And what we have done is we have now, um, again, be able to find you know, these, these convergent set of semi-definite programs, so an ever tighter and tighter characterization of at least some quantum correlations um, subject to causal constraints, right? So we have first convergent FPP hierarchies, at least for some quantum causal compatibility problems, not yet in general, it's very hard. Okay, good. So it will now become much more technical, my, my, my slide, so that's the remnants of the talk, how I envisioned it you know, yesterday. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit what the technical problem is one has to solve. Okay, so we have one of these causal um, uh, hypotheses, again, three observers, Alice, Bob, and Charlie, two quantum states being distributed. Bob's system is subdivided into two subsystems, one that receives the message shared with Alice, one that receives the message shared with Charlie, and they get inputs or settings. So, you know, that is which measurement setting to perform, and then they generate data. Yeah, that's the, the hypothesis we have in mind. We don't know whether it's true. What we have is that, you know, the experimentalists came to us and they gave us this um, array of conditional probabilities they measured out by doing a gazillion experiments in the lab. Thank you, experimentalists, that's much appreciated. All right, now they are done, but our headaches only start. So it's com com uh, compatible if, and now there's this existential quantifier. So all of these elements, building blocks in the hypothesis, you know, we have to decide whether or not they exist. And what is it that we have to decide existence of? So first we have to have commuting observable algebras here. Yeah, so that's how we model locality, right? So we have to find 
observables that, that, that were implemented for Alice, Bob, and Charlie. We don't assume that we have a model of the quantum system, as we never do in Bell, in Bell experiments. Any quantum model will be okay, and so, right, so there is these observable al algebras whose existence we have to either confirm or to disprove. Then there is um, a joint state, right? So that's the joint state that in the tensor product picture would be called sigma AB tensor sigma BC, but here I call it rho, and I'm using this algebraic notation where, you, where for an expectation value you don't write trace rho observable, but rho off, and then you give the arguments. So if I evaluate the state on a product observable, then it has to factorize here across this cut in the middle through Bob. Okay? And so that's you know, kind of a big headache because that's a nonlinear constraint. Rho appears quadratically on the right, and really there was very little understanding how to solve these problems. Um, right, so we have to, okay, then we have to, um, you know, decide whether they are P of VMs on Alice, Bob's, and Charlie's side. P of VM means these are non-negative operators summing to the identity such that the experimental data I have here on the left gets reproduced in this model. Okay, and so, right, so the difficulties, again, the first difficulty is how do I construct these observable algebras? The second difficulty is how do I handle the nonlinearity? And there's a third difficulty which actually took the most of our time, namely how do I do the subdivision of Bob? But I don't think I will have time to talk about it. So even though that's the hardest part, five minutes, I will not actually talk much about it. Okay, so now there is a, like a, you know, entire string of ideas that gets, in, that gets used to build these SDP hierarchies. And maybe with five minutes, there is only one of them that I will um, try to explain to you because it's also kind of cool. It's called the inflation method, and this name has been around since a few years. It was uh, developed here at Perimeter Institute in, in, in 2016 at a time where the word inflation, everybody sound, thought it sounded funny, and now everybody thinks it sounds sad. But, um, <laughs> right, okay. Uh -huh. Okay, so, um, uh, right, but that's how it's called. Okay, and they're, they're different. They're in, it's actually interesting because I said in the beginning that not even classically are these problems well understood. And in fact, the first group of people who, who gave a good characterization of classical causal uh, um, problems were these people who you might know because they're all quantum researchers. So actually the quantum gang solved the classical problem first and then uh, has been working on the quantum uh, uh, problem ever since. All right, so hooray for quantum. Good, and so what is the idea? So the idea is, remember the problem is that we have this nonlinear constraint. Uh, rho of A, C is rho of A times rho of C, really not good. And the idea is to relax it and to replace uh, independence by symmetry, okay? So let me try to um, say what the idea is. Okay, so we have these, these Christmas trees that you know, pop up on my slides everywhere, and it, the, the logic is the following, it says that if P is compatible with my causal hypothesis, then I can use these causal ingredients and build a much bigger model about which I can also make statements. And what do I do? I, okay, so let's say there are these um, states here shared between these two parties, the state shared between these two, and the, shared, the state shared between these two. So it's now this triangular scenario. Then I can copy them, right? I can have a new set you know, I have two uh, shared states here, two shared states there, and two different shared states there. And then I can also distribute those copies to Alice, Bob, and Charlie in, in, this, uh, in this network. And then um, what I can do is I can, I can, now Charlie doesn't just get one input from the left and one input from the right. Charlie gets one input from the first level from the left and from the right, and one input from the second level from the left and from the right. And so the joint measurement that Charlie performs can now be performed between the first level or between the second level or across, like first level from the right, second level from the left, and so on. And so I get a much, much, whoa, are you sure you want to shut down your computer? No, cancel. Okay, that was close. Okay, some button I pressed here. Uh, okay, and so um, we have now this much more complicated object where we have n copies of all the hidden states, n squared copies of the observables. And now, because they, can, they are all the same, I have this permutational symmetry. So if I evaluate the state on the first level, I can also evaluate the state where I change two indices and Alice and Bob mix the first and the second level and it, it needs to be the same. All right, and so that's a consequence of independence is symmetry. 
And now, okay, so the first, you know, of this like five ideas and the last one I can present and then I'm, I'm done is um, that you can actually walk the other way around. So there is this uh, um, entire field of study called Definetti the theorems that tells you that um, if, you have, if you have infinite symmetry, you can, you know, um, turn things around and deduce independence from symmetry. And so that was proven in many different contexts, but it wasn't proven before in the commuting operator model. So as you know, task number one we had to achieve is uh, to uh, you know, have a max tensor product definite. It's very oper operator algebraic. But what we can do is we can get rid of these, um, of these non-linearities by going to a much bigger inflated model and imposing symmetry. Yeah, and then we can walk back. All right, so that's idea number one, and then there is idea number two, and it already says just here in this little extra illustration, so I kind of knew I would, you know, stop here. Universal algebras, if you like C-star algebras, talk to me. Uh, if you like polynomial optimization, talk to me. Then we had to go to von Neumann algebras. If you like von Neumann algebras, talk to me too. Aha, I presented that one at Perimeter Institute, so the formula is labeled by a hockey stick because that appeals to the local audience. And, um, and I will not explain that to you at all. And if you put it all together, then um, you arrive at the summary, namely that it's very fruitful to um, marry causal analysis with quantum theory. There's many interesting problems, very little understood. So if you want to like, leave your mark on the field, you can decide problems. Nobody has any idea how they work. And the theory is still not well understood. But first scenarios can now be treated by convergent SDP hierarchies. And with this, I thank you. And these are two cherries in love with a disco ball. Don't ask me why. All right. Thank you very much, David, for your uh, very interesting and ins insightful presentation. Uh, I have a, a first question for you. Um, when you said, why do we care? Yeah. I was a bit surprised you didn't listen uh, that if this can be used for uh, showing quantum advantage or hardness, essentially, results. Because, for instance, we know for the uh, quantum advantage from uh, Google, they use it to show that uh, simulating or uh, predicting a distribution of a quantum circuits is very hard, uh, so it's untreatable for a classical circuit. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was thinking whether your approach based on uh, geometry, I see that there is interaction graph and so on, can also be used as some up so to craft such yeah. a hardness result. So I think the right, um, I, I want to say yes, but the answer is probably no. I don't think we can achieve that because the right context of this research is not quantum computing, but quantum communication. Yeah, so it definitely, def definitely gives you an advantage in quantum communication scenarios. So if the hidden states shared are quantum, there are things you can do that you couldn't do with classically hidden states, but, but, but they, are not, they don't relate to computational complexity. And if you talk about you know, this Google quantum advantage um, um, paper, of course, they aim at a computational advantage. And so that is not the goal here. It is, it is a communication advantage. So why would we care in the end is, uh, I guess, for having communication protocols that observe some network communication task, maybe voting, maybe co coordination of different parties in a network um, that you can't do classically, but they are not computational in nature. So, you know, we can't, uh, so, so, so the Google line of research would not directly benefit from this. Thank you. Are there other questions? So it's, uh, it's Weinfurter, not König in Munich speak. Uh, so th thank you for your um, very interesting and motivating um, talk. Um, what I wanted to ask, uh, you said that you copy the hidden states, and I was wondering what you really mean with yeah. Um, copying. Yeah, yeah. When I copy the hidden state, that's of course a logical uh, operation, not a physical operation. Um, right, of course, like in a Bell experiment, you can also, uh, yeah, so, 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 so you all reason about the, the mathematics of the underlying model, right? And what you, what it's, it's really an existent, existence statement. There is, right? So if the, the, the correlation that somebody came uh, to you from the lab has a model where hidden states were shared between the parties and then locally measured, then there could also have been a different experiment where the hidden states were replicated and uh, Alice, Bob, and Charlie had more choices of what to measure. Yeah, but it's not that you could physically t 
turn your experiment into one uh, with that acts on multiple copies. So that's purely an, a mathematical existence statement that we have here, that we use for the argument. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Other questions? So maybe, maybe you mentioned it, but I didn't hear it. So when you were explaining that you have to now make sure that you uh, ensure that on Bob's side that you separate the two, how did you achieve yeah, that? Yeah, okay, so you're asking for the thing I didn't want to talk about, partly because they're hard to explain and partly because uh, it has, no wait, how do I do this? This one here is a technical problem and Okay, okay, I am um, here, right, okay. Partly because that's hard to explain, partly because it caused me a lot of, lot of headaches. Okay, good, so this is gonna be very highly compressed. So there are two difficulties with this constraint. The first difficulty is that it's nonlinear, but we know how to deal with that. The second difficulty is that um, this existence statement means Bob's system has two halves, one receiving the message shared with Alice and one receiving the message shared with, with Charlie. Now I have to construct these observable algebras of Alice, of Bob, and of Charlie. And how do I actually do it? I haven't told you, but now let me tell it you in one sentence. What we know, well, these observable algebras, they certainly contain the P of VMs, right? And so we know nothing else about them because we don't make any assumptions, so we assume that the observable algebras are generated as algebras by the P of VMs. And that works for Alice's side, that works for Bob's side, but it does not work, work uh, sorry, for, for Alice and Charlie it's fine, but it does not necessarily work for Bob, because in Bob I need to have, you know, product, I need to have product observables, and the P of VMs, they might all be entangled, and the algebra generated by the P of VMs might not be big enough to contain the products. So this is, I think, you know, if you really, you know, solve all the other problems, the last one that, that still sticks and that we really can solve only in special cases is how do we um, construct a, you know, how do we enforce that, that, that Bob's observables are generated on a, on a product space? And this is, is, you know, I don't know. In special cases we can do it, but in general we have no idea. And it might well be that there is some computational or algorithmic intractability there and that, that you can't do it in general. I don't know that. But that is the big, big, big problem that we are still thinking about. Okay, thanks. Very good. There is maybe time for our last quick question. Uh, if not, we can, of course, continue during coffee break or lunch break. So let us thank again our uh, speaker and his uh, young assistant. Thank you.